You are listening to Matchpoint Canada, the official podcast of Tennis Canada. Very happy to welcome our guest for this week. He's an author, content creator, I think one of the very best, and a social media freelancer for the tours as well. So happy to welcome back Bastien Fachon to the podcast. Bastien, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me again. Uh, it's becoming a bit of a routine to do a post Wimbledon recap together. So happy to be with you uh, tonight. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely have to make this a, an annual ritual, get you on uh, post All England Club and, and recap all the action and uh, what a Wimbledon and what a two weeks it was. And we can we can start on the men's side, maybe just initially your first impressions of what we saw Carlos Alcaraz repeating as, as champion and, and collecting his fourth major title. How, how impressed were you by what Carlos managed to do these past two weeks? Very, very impressed. Uh, winning Ron Garros and Wimbledon back to back is sort of a mythical achievement. Uh, those are the two natural surface majors that maybe apart from Australians and Americans, every player uh, has on top of their bucket list. Um, I do believe it's becoming less hard, less of a pipe dream to win them both the same year. But uh, at the same time, only five men before Alcaraz did it uh, in the Open era. And you have only names like Laver, Borg and the big three. So, uh, so yeah, only legends of the game. And uh, yeah, doing it at, at 21, it's just super impressive. Yeah. And speaking of legends of the game, obviously, I mean, we, we got the rematch that maybe a lot of tennis fans wanted with Alcaraz facing Djokovic in the finals. And what a contrast to last year's final. I, I mean, you felt like last year's final was a, a flip of the coin going deep into a fifth set. And here in this one, Alcaraz just completely outclassing Djokovic in all aspects, 6-2, 6, -2, 6, -2, 7 -6. Uh, Were you surprised it was that straightforward for Carlos? Um, I was expecting the match to be maybe four sets, but I think uh, Alcaraz was the heavy favorite this time. Uh, you could feel that uh, Djokovic was uh, doing his age, uh, so to say. Uh, I felt the same way uh, in Australia against Sinner. Um, it's just, you can feel that he's uh, not on the decline, but it's, it's becoming harder and harder to compete against the Alcaraz and the Sinners uh, for him, especially coming from, uh, from surgery. Um, you know, just making the final in those circumstances uh, was uh, an incredible achievement in itself. And uh, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't expecting him to win this final, to be honest. But uh, well, he put on a fight in, in the third set, and it could have been he, he could have won a set uh, at the end. But uh, yeah, Alcaraz to me played one of the greatest matches of his career. He was he was a picture perfect. Uh, from start to finish, only in that game serving for the match he got broken. But apart from that, he was just in a class of his own. And and even Djokovic said it himself. There's nothing he could have done on the day. So yeah, fair play to Akras. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Matchpoint Canada. If you'd like to follow along every week, give us a like below. Hit the subscribe button as we're trying to make 15,000 subs. We'll talk a little bit more about Novak and where he goes from here, but I'm curious, I guess, where Alcaraz goes from here. As you mentioned, 21 years old, he's now four for four, uh, four and oh in major finals as well, which is just an astounding record. And he was, I think, in his uh, post match ceremony, he was rather humble when asked if uh, how he viewed himself. And he doesn't view himself as one of the great, great champions yet. Is it, you know, something we should expect to see him get there in the next five to 10 years. Obviously this is something hard to project, but it, it really looks like he could be one of the dominant forces of the tour for many years to come. Yeah. We mentioned the list of players that achieved the Rangaros and Wimbledon double the same year. Um, and I think he's headed that direction uh, to the legend of the game. You have the big three and then you have Laver and Borg who won uh, 11 Grand Slams each. I think he's headed to, to legend status. Uh, you don't do the things he did at his age, uh, you know, winning the Channel Slam, getting to world number one as a teenager, winning slams on every surface, uh, beating Djokovic back to back Wimbledon finals uh, by accident. It, it's still very early, but he's on his way to becoming one of the greatest ever. 
uh, there's no ceiling we can put on him really. Um, if I had to uh, hazard a guess, I would I would say he's gonna hit double digits in in majors. Uh, it's hard to to give a number uh, because you cannot really know uh, what Sinner and and Runo and and Musetti and so on are gonna do, how they're gonna improve their games and and try to match with him. But um, yeah, I think he's gonna he's gonna be somewhere between. I would say, yeah, 11. So same level as Borg and, and Lever. And maybe the, the highest prediction would be 25, you know, which would put him above Djokovic. So, yeah, my guess would be uh, double digits for him. Yeah, I, I certainly feel the same way. And you mentioned his age and doing what he's doing at his age. I mean, we should give credit, as you said, to see Novak Djokovic do what he does at his age, at age 37, to be back in a, a Wimbledon final. And yet at the same time, after winning three slams last season, we're going out now in mid-July, and it's just so unusual to see Djokovic at this stage of a tennis calendar season without any title, let alone a major. Uh, that kind of begs the question, I think a lot of people are asking, are we officially seeing a, a changing of the guard here in the tennis landscape on the men's side? Um, I think uh, Djokovic definitely earned the right uh, to have us wait a little bit more to call to call it a, a changing of the guard. I think it's, it's too strong of an expression. Uh, we said that already after last year's Wimbledon final, and then he rebounded by winning the US Open and the ATP finals. We said that again after the Sinner uh, semifinal in Australia, and and then you know he still made the Wimbledon final after a tough season and a surgery. So yeah, to me, he's still one of the top three, four favorites, uh, with also Medvedev for the US Open. And I think he's going to be competitive. And, and he said he still wants to play for another two, three years at least. And, you know, the way he's uh, treating his body and his mind, I don't think he's really going anywhere until he decides it's time to go. And I don't really think it's, it's happening as long as he believes he still has a shot at winning major titles. And I don't think he was that far off at Wimbledon, you know, Alcaraz could have very well uh, lost against Tiafo. He was two points away yep. from losing to Tiafo in the in the third round, and then it's the same situation as um, you know Iga and um, and Osaka at Roland Garros. You know, if Iga loses, then it's fair game to anyone. Um, so Djokovic could have could have won Wimbledon again. So um, my my point is. Um, I think he starts to understand that it's getting harder and harder to beat Sinner and Alcaraz in Grand Slams. But is he going to have to face them at every Grand Slam? I'm not sure. You have uh, you can have other players take care of them for you, and then you know you're just reaping the rewards. And for example, if he were to face Medvedev in a Grand Slam final today, I would favor him. I would favor mm -hmm. Djokovic over Medvedev. So. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what happens, but uh, I I give him another maybe a couple of years to still be competitive, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, great, great point. Um, really, the one the one trophy missing, obviously, from from Djokovic's uh, vast case and everything he's accomplished is uh, that that gold medal. And we know now he's targeting the Summer Games, and you ha we have to see another switch back to the clay court surface. Do you view him as one of the contenders to maybe deliver in Paris? And uh, who would your maybe short list of contenders be to, to medal there? Uh, yeah, he's definitely one of the contenders. Um, if I had to rank the favorites uh, in terms of number of stars, I would say maybe five stars, Alcaraz, uh, four stars, Sinner. Then three stars, you have Djokovic, Zverev, Kasper. And then uh, below that, I would put Nadal, Tsitsipas, Holger, Medvedev, Dominor. Um, a lot of players can be competitive, especially if it's best of three. But um, yeah, uh, my leading trio is Alcaraz, Sinner, and Djokovic with Alcaraz and, St and Sinner a bit a bit higher than Djokovic because they're just like 50, 15 years younger than him and they can recover faster than him 
because they have to play uh, every day. There's not much rest. It's like a Masters 1000, uh, the Olympics. So, uh, so yeah, I, w- I would favor Alcaraz and Sinner. But I, I certainly hope that, that Djokovic is going to medal and especially win a gold medal. That would be the ultimate dream. It's it's the one thing he's never won and he's been chasing it for since since Beijing 2008. So mm-hmm. I would I hope I hope he gets it. Well, uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, if we shift over to the women's side. Uh, I mean, certainly a lot more of an unlikely tournament than we could have expected compared to the men's um, started with unusual things in terms of Arena Sabalenka pulling out of the tournament. We saw a number of top players lose early like Iga and Coco. And uh, look, we've seen surprising champions in the past here, uh, just last season, Marketa Vondrosova. Uh, but how unlikely was was this run maybe from Bar- Barbara Krajcikova, who obviously she's a Grand Slam champion, but I have to admit she was probably not on my list of top 20 contenders heading in. I have to admit she wasn't on my list either, but uh, it was maybe a little less surprising than uh, Vondrosova's run last year. Uh, because she had been there before. Um, I think in a way, but it, it was very similar uh, to her run to, to the wrong girls title in, in 2021. Both times she was uh, ranked in the, in the 30s. Uh, she had to battle in three sets in the first round. Nobody was really watching. And then she took out a couple of big names on the way. Uh, remember, Ron Garros, uh, it was Vitolina and Coco in the quarters. And uh, at Wimbledon, it was Collins and, and Ostapenko. And then, you know, you start wondering, like, is she, go- she going to go all the way? And you know she's done it before. And then in the semis, she faces the highest uh, seed remaining, uh, Sakari at Ron Garros, and then Riba Kina here at Wimbledon. And and she comes from the brink and she and she beats them and then you know it's it's fair game in the final she's facing an opponent against whom she's like 50 50 odds uh, on paper and and she took advantage of it both times uh, even the finals were pretty similar she won both of them six four in in the third um, and I was I was very impressed by the the composure that she showed both times. It was like she was a, a 10-time Grand Slam champion playing for just another one, uh, you know, and um, that, that forces a lot of respect. Um, and, uh, yeah, we mentioned that uh, she's not the first player in recent years to to win a title at, at Roland Garros and then to win one at Wimbledon in the next year or two years or three years. There's been Muguruza and, and, and Barty and... Uh, who was the um, who was the third one um Halep yes, so uh, yeah, yeah th- there seems to be a, a pathway between Warren Garros and, and Wimbledon and that uh echoes what we said before that it's getting maybe easier to win both you can you can win Warren Garros and Wimbledon playing the sort of same game style uh nowadays with the slowing down of surfaces so um so yeah um uh, an unlikely champion but certainly a deserving one yeah i i think the word definitely i i think of when i think of her style of play is is that calmness and, and fluidity with the way barbara just competes on on the court do you, do you imagine maybe her experience helped her in that final a lot against paulini though we have seen jasmine now in in consecutive grand slam finals yeah yeah i think uh the fact that she She'd been there before, definitely helped her. The only time I really felt like her nerves were playing against her was when she served for the match and she, and mm-hmm. she was 30, 30 love up. And then she double faulted. She's starting to feel the moments. She had to face a couple of break points. But uh, yeah, uh, the rest of the final, especially the first set, she was, she was dominant. Uh, she was, uh, you know, uh, playing... Um, yeah, controlling the tempo of the game uh, like a conductor uh, and, yeah, uh, playing her game style. Um, very, uh, very skillful, mixing it up with the slice backhand. Um, she was the one in control, playing her game. Um, yeah, uh, very, very impressive. And, um, and uh, I think she might win another Wimbledon because she has the perfect game for, for grass and... 
and uh, and we cannot uh, discount her for the Olympics as well. I don't know if she's going to have enough time to reset and, and really rest up uh, before the Olympics. But uh, yeah, she has to be one of the contenders now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with with her ability, as you mentioned, on, on that surface as well. We, we should touch on Paolini just a little bit. Um, what a season she's she's put together. Uh, the French Open final, uh, now a Wimbledon final, big title in Dubai. And I think you shared a stat of where she was in the WTA points race, and I couldn't believe it. And and now she's top five in the world. Uh, I have to say, I really didn't see this type of 2024 coming from the Italian. Yeah, I didn't see it either. Um, yeah, at the, at the start of the year, I had I tweeted a list of like 10 storylines to follow uh, this season. And yeah, she wasn't in it because she wasn't um, um, a household name before. She wasn't an established player. Um, she's a new name at the top that nobody really expected at the, at the start of the year. Um, and yeah, 28 years old. Uh, I think her coach started working with her full time uh, at the beginning of this year or the end of last year. And she probably got more self-belief in her from that. And then she's having a breakthrough run in Dubai, winning her first Masters kind of out of nowhere. And then just backing it up with finals at Rangaus and Wimbledon. That's that's incredible. Um, that's that's something only the the Williams sisters and and Justinena had done before her on the women's side. So only absolute legends of the game. Um, it's it's incredible. It's inspirational, and it's the proof that you're only ever one year away from completely changing your life and. And the uh, and the public's perception of your career. Yeah, that's uh, that's well said. As as we wrap up, I, I want to get your thoughts maybe on the summer games for for the women's side as well. Um, I have to think Iga Swiatek will be the favorite in Paris, especially given given the surface. But what other names maybe are you really keeping keeping an eye on to to maybe be a contender to medal there? Um, I would say Ribakina uh, and Coco. Uh, Sabalenka isn't playing, right? Yeah, she's uh, not out. So, she's out. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, Ribakina, Coco, uh, Paulini, of course, uh, Krejcikova, if she if she uh, has enough time to rest up, and then you know the usual suspects. Um, I might give names that are not playing. I'm not quite sure. I have to check again. But I would say Vondrusova, uh, Collins, Ostapenko. Svitolina, Sakari, uh, Kazatkina, Andreeva, uh, even even Osaka. Like the, there's so many uh, names that can that can be uh, contenders for medals. But I think it's Iga's gold medal to lose. Really, uh, she has to be considered as as the heavy favorite. Uh, she had more time to go back to clay after uh, exiting early at Wimbledon, and uh, so yeah, I would be very surprised if she doesn't make if she doesn't make it to the medal rounds. And if she doesn't win the gold medal, um, but yeah, at the at the same time, you never know. But uh, yeah, I think I think he guys gonna win the gold medal. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, with you there, uh, Bastian. It's uh, always a pleasure. Um, I hope we can keep up our our annual post Wimbledon chat because it's always great to have you yeah. on Match Point Canada. Thanks uh, so much for joining us. Definitely, let's go for the three peat next year. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Ben.